gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, knowing your grace and your love that you have for us. We're so thankful for this opportunity you've given us just to feast together upon your word. I ask that we would focus on things above, not on things below that we would fasten our eyes on you and not ourselves. We're so thankful that you are our teacher. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not true and seal to our hearts the truth of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Thank you for joining us. We've been studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 8, uh, somewhere around verse 12. If you followed us through this study, you may remember that uh, Paul left a productive evangelistic campaign at Troas uh, for Corinth. Uh, God was sovereign over every step that he took through his life. And I pointed out how that I believe that God is more concerned about the needs of his people uh, than he is the gospel itself. And I believe that's what we've seen as we've studied through these marvelous verses. God cares about his people's needs. And we see that in chapter 8 in the context of giving uh, a collection for the saints at Jerusalem, um, the needs of the saints. And I'm gonna say that means more than money. Uh, it's uh, probably, at, at least at the very least, um, it's, uh, it's every spiritual, physical need, uh, you know, every need, whether it's physical or spiritual. Uh, and particularly, I believe, spiritual. I believe God is much more concerned that you understand how rich you are, how that you've been so enriched in Christ, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, um, than he is whether you win the lottery. And God calls this ministry. He relates that to ministry a uh, caring for one another, uh, a mutual concern that's based upon grace. I pointed out how that uh, uh, grace brought about change. We've seen that how grace brought about the change that was needed in the lives of those carnal Corinthians. Uh, and the text here that we've been looking at says that they knew this. They, they knew they had an experiential knowledge, the word is gnosko, that this change that had taken place was a result of God's grace. And as I pointed out, we were looking at the most carnal group of Christians at that time at least, at least uh, prob most likely the most carnal group on the planet. Now. At the same time, I would have to say that there's carnality in every fellowship, every, every group of believers on the planet. You're going to find carnality, but God was very concerned about the Corinthians and used them as an example so that we would learn from it 2,000 years later. His word is timeless. It's not limited by time, so the application of God's word carries forth uh, a message for us here today. I want to talk just a little bit about that experiential knowledge. Now back was when I was in Bible college, we, we looked at how that there was such a thing as propositional revelation. And what, what they meant by that was that it's just mere knowledge. It's knowledge apart from faith. It's just gaining knowledge sort of on the uh, on the human level, it's propositional revelation. That explains why so many people can know Scripture and yet not be uh, one of God's children. children. Uh, they, they may not be a Christian, but 
but they're certainly capable of quoting Scripture uh, and even to some extent understanding Scripture. But then there comes a time, well, there's, there is a purpose for uh, enlightenment, uh, uh, illumination. The Holy Spirit is involved here in this work. It's not that, and I, and I fear that most Christians today, uh, or at least many, many Christians today, tend to go about their daily lives, uh, their, their walk, their fellowship, their communion with God, and they kind of look at it as if sort of God is sort of taking a back seat to what's going on. He's, he's, a, he's a passive observer. He's waiting to see what you will do. And then he uh, acts or, or he works, uh, you know, accordingly. You know, it's, whatever he does is kind of dependent upon what the believer does. I don't see where that that's biblical at all. The, there is a process that can be understood from New Testament revelation concerning the Holy Spirit's function in the life of the believer and the work of Christ and the ongoing uh, work of God the Father in the believer's life, where that, that propositional revelation then becomes, and, and let me back up for a moment, the, the propositional revelation comes about as a result of study you know, being the noble Berean and, and studying to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But God doesn't reveal knowledge uh, indiscriminately. He doesn't reveal knowledge uh, for no reason or without purpose. And so we go from that in this process, we go from propositional revelation to perfect knowledge, that's oida in the Greek, the word knowledge, oida. Now this is followed by gnosko, an experiential knowledge, which uh, when we get to that, it's, it's, we have that experiential knowledge because God invested faith in our lives to trust Him concerning what He said was true. So there's a, an investment of, of faith in the believer's life concerning the illuminated, the illumined truth that the Holy Spirit revealed. Uh, there is a, my point here that I, that I want to make sure that I don't, I don't miss uh, making or, or I don't want you to get confused about or, or, understand, or misunderstand here is, is that God, the, the most, probably the single most important thing about all of this is that we are not just left to our own devices. God is continuing to work in our lives. I mean, He is working in our lives 24-7. He's working even when you're sleeping. God is at work, actively at work in your life in some way, in some capacity. It doesn't matter where you're at, what you're doing, you know, what, what you're going through. You know, whether you're going through heavy trials and afflictions or whether everything is sort of sailing along pretty smooth, God doesn't cease to work. And your involvement in His Word is a work of grace. You would not even open that book if it was not for God's grace in your life. And I believe He gives a common grace to many people. But we go from propositional revelation to illumined truth where that we have which is based upon perfect knowledge. That's understanding it the way that God understands it, not understanding it the way that we think we, you know, understand it or the way that we would like to understand it. But we understand it the way He does. And then faith is invested in our lives. And then as a result of that, a test, that, that faith must be tested. It's not the Christian, folks, that's tested. It is the faith that is tested. And he says, after we have been tested, we shall come forth as gold. So we wind up with an experiential knowledge where the truth of that and all that wonderful truth becomes a practical uh, reality in our lives through in some experiential way. And believe it or not, there is another word 
uh, that goes beyond experiential knowledge. It's, it's uh, uh, over and beyond experiential knowledge. It's epigonosko in the Greek, and uh, we may talk about that sometime. But it, it is about the ability that God gives. Uh, uh, we see that in verse 12, uh, that in the context of giving and, and uh, meeting the, the needs of the saints, ministering to the needs of the saints. And I believe that that includes more than money. It's uh, maybe, maybe my brother and sister in Christ, all they need is someone to, to listen uh, they just may need some a word of encouragement. They may need fellowship. They may need uh, uh, many other things besides just money. I mean, just you can't just throw money at a problem and it uh, and expect it to be uh, fixed. It is not burdensome. Our text is telling us that this giving by these Corinthians, they they've come to realize it's not. And God the Holy Spirit, and I, and I keep reminding everyone this is not Paul's logic that we're looking at. It's not his, his reasoning. It's not based on what we're reading. It's not based on human reasoning or human logic or Paul's thoughts or Paul's ideas or Paul's ideology or anything else. It is the Word of God. Uh, Paul merely was a tool, an instrument in God's hands. To write what he wrote and I don't believe for one second that Paul understood everything that he wrote and I think it makes a, a tremendous difference when we study through the Word of God whether we're looking at this and we're filtering all that through this perspective of, of you know well is this a human author that, that's been dead for 2,000 years that we're looking at nearly 2,000 years or is this the Word of God but it's not burdensome. God's concern is for a spiritual equality. Okay, we'll, we see that in the text, equality. And I'm, I do not believe that that's, uh, well, I'll just tell you, I think that's a spiritual equality. It's not, uh, uh, we're not looking at Christian communism here. You know, like, okay, you need some help, and so I, I help you, I give you, I give you some help, some money, some, some you know, or if it's not money, I do something but to help uh, another brother or a sister in Christ. And then when I need it, they give it, they give it back to me. Now, if we're talking about money, and I give it to them, and then, you know, when they need it, and then when I need it, they give it to me, and then, and then not, well, and then they need it again, so I give it back to them, and it just goes back and back and forth, back and forth. And that's, well, that, that really doesn't accomplish anything. Not really. It's, and it's certainly not, you know, this, this whole idea of Christian back-scratching. Well, I did this for you, therefore you need to do, you ought to do this for me. And that comes into, into the text heavily when we look at, at Christ having done what He did for us. And so the idea is that, you know, with most commentators, well, it's, well this is what Christ did, you know, uh, that though he was, uh, he was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So the idea being, you know, well, since Christ did this for us, and this, this is how Christ did this, this is the way we ought to do this. And so it's, it's an example. I don't see that as an example uh, at all. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not what I'm reading in the text. Um, verse 9 it is not an example. It's rather a statement of fact concerning what Christ willingly did. You know, He came to do, I came to do Thy will, O God. So, so Paul leaves this uh, productive evangelistic campaign at Troas uh, for Corinth. Uh, uh, we're looking at, I pointed out in the, in the last several videos that in this chapter alone we see grace mentioned seven times. Seven times. And when we see grace mentioned that often, I think we need to take notice. Now, when it comes to the subject of giving and tithing and offerings and, and that sort of thing, as we, you know, to use the modern day, you know, uh, 
language uh, about all that. Uh, first of all, I, I, for one, I do not believe uh, that the church, the body of Christ, uh, was instructed to tithe 10% of their income or any percent of their income at all, that it's not based upon uh, Jewish uh, tithing. Uh, it's not based upon that at all. Now, many people believe that, that it is. Uh, we're, we're looking at grace here versus the Jewish tithing of 10%. Our, our very text says, not by commandment, okay? Dearly beloved, grace is the cornerstone of our service, our worship, when it comes to the act of giving or ministering to the needs of the saints, whether they're spiritual needs, spiritual needs, whether they're physical or spiritual needs. If it's not under written by grace, then it, it's not really acceptable or favorable to God. That is what our text says. Uh, he mentions how that it was in, in affliction, poverty, and joy, that these believers, they came to, to be sincerely generous. Generous. And I'm telling you, I'm suggesting to you that grace alone, only grace alone can do that. Law does not do that. Grace causes us, according to our text, to... Uh, to abound in, in everything else. So this is what the text says. So why would that not be true when it comes to giving? Dearly beloved, listen to me very close. We, we here at Blessed Hope Forever, we understand very well that, uh, that those who teach labor and teach the word, you know, are worthy, you know, of double honor, that they're worthy of support. We understand that. The reason we don't emphasize that too heavily or push that too heavily or the reason why that we don't, we don't look at uh, the financial aspect of all of that, you know, it's like, well, we're going to sell coffee cups and we're going to sell t-shirts and we're going to sell books and tapes and CDs and, and whatever, prayer cloths, whatever else, you know. You know it's, uh, the reason why we're not interested in any of that is because this is not a business enterprise. It is a Christian ministry, and I would beg you people, I beg you, okay, and I, and I don't speak in these terms very often, but I beg every one of you, that if you are giving to any ministry, including this one, if you're giving to a ministry, if you're doing it out of a sense of debt or obligation to God or to that ministry, like the, you know you owe them because they've given something to you, so you owe something back to them, and then, and you somehow you have this cockeyed idea that and I you know it's, that God is a uh, is, is, is very well pleased, you know, when you do that, it, which he's not, it, I guess what I'm really trying to drive, what I'm driving at here, folks, is first of all, first of all, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, please do not give to this ministry for your sake. Please don't give to this ministry. If you are giving uh, to this ministry to help support this ministry and you're doing it out of a sense of obligation to gain merit or favor with God or out of a sense of duty, uh, 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 an obligation as if this is your, uh, God is just demands just that you a tithe 10%, you know, or whatever. If, if, you're, if that's the reason you're doing it, 
Don't do it. Please don't do it. For your sake, please don't do it. I'm reading in the text that it was by the will of God that these believers gave the way that they did. It was by, according to God's will. God, the text clearly states, folks, that God made them willing. God made them willing. Well, he doesn't do that by, by law. I mean, by promoting this idea of, of law. We, the Christian is not under law as a rule of life. He's under grace. And the reason why the, I believe that grace is mentioned seven times in this is God doesn't want us to, to miss seeing the fact that giving has nothing to do at all, you know, with some sense of obligation. That there's someone else working behind the scenes here. You know, that God is, he's got hands on this. I mean, he's, he's hands, he's all over this. God hasn't left us to our own devices. He's working in each one of our lives. And it is a grace. Giving is a grace, folks. It is not a mandate. You don't have to give, you know, contrary to, to probably, you know, most what I would, I'm accustomed to hearing most preachers preach today, or even the commentaries that I read. Uh, I would have to vehemently disagree, you know, with, with most of them that in, 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 in suggesting that God does not need, God doesn't need your money, okay? This ministry doesn't need your money. Now it appreciates it. Uh, in in fact, uh, you know, there's a there's a fine line here. I mean, it's because it's drawn. The line is drawn by the will of God, the work of God, the love of God, the grace of God. Of of course, we need your support, but that is not our primary concern. If you support any ministry, whether it's this one or any other ministry, your church that you go to, uh, uh, some uh, other Christian organization that you want to support or, or non-Christian organization that you want to support, if you're giving at all, giving of your time, your money, your resources, your talent, your if you're in any way involved in giving, Please, please, folks, take note of the fact that the only giving that is approved by God is that which comes by the will of God in, in Him bestowing the grace of God upon you and making you willing, giving you a heart to give. And, that, uh, and it's because He cares about the needs of the saints. It was beyond their power or ability, says my text, left, left to their own devices to give properly, to give in a way that honors God. The flesh is incapable of doing that on its own. Or that uh, you've sort of disconnected from you know, the working of God in your life. You're kind of out here on a limb on your own and you, you just feel like that God's left you there you know, to, to just do what he, you think that he says to do. And it's kind of all up to you. You know, he doesn't give a grace. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't do that at all. He just, he's, he's, he's given you a law and that's, you got to tithe 10%. This ministry could not disagree with that anymore. I, and uh, that is just not the case. Love, I'm saying, is inseparably connected with God's grace in giving. And note that the text says that, that they gave themselves to the Lord first. They gave themselves to Him first. What, what is the text telling us? Well, it's quite simply telling us that, that God is not... In, separated from this. He's not apart from this. He's not disconnected from this.
verse 9 is, is not an example. It's not an example. It's just an, a statement of fact concerning what Christ willingly did. And it's not burdensome. We're not looking at Christian communism. You know, if this ministry, folks, if God decides that, that this ministry, He doesn't need it anymore or, or He's got other plans or, you know, if we're, if we're not supported and we're not able to do this, if for whatever reason, uh, I'm good with that. I'm fine with that. I'm, do would I, would I love to continue preaching the Word? Would I love to continue seeing others uh, set free from man-made bondage, you know, of law and legalism and, you know, to the freedom that they have in Christ? Well, of course I would. Uh, I've always felt like, you know, I mean, I was formerly trained as a, as a pastor. I was formerly educated uh, in, in, how to, in learning how to, how to study the Word and to present the Word. Uh, I don't think I'm as great as people say I am at it. I, I work hard at it. Uh, but if God decides He wants to do something else with my me and my life, then that's fine. I, I, we, we, are, we do not have this ministry where we have to have X amount of, of dollars coming in in order to, to actually keep it going. You know, I can pretty much keep it going on a shoestring if I have to. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to be brave enough to tell you this and honest enough to tell you this, uh, knowing that, you know, it's some of you out there may, that, that do support this ministry, you may do it out of, the, out of that sense of tithing 10%. Uh, I don't think you should. I, I don't think you should at all. I don't think that's, that is not what we're reading in this chapter. And this is one of the most prim primary chapters uh, when it comes to giving. You know, we see the illustration that God uses here about Israel in the wilderness with manna. You know, the manna, it's, uh, I've always looked at man, that manna that, that He provided, you know, as a sort of a symbolic of God's Word, you know, and uh, they got sick and tired of it because it was what God gave them uh, constantly. And, uh, you know, Bible study can be, become burdensome. Uh, people can, can get tired, you know, just of Bible study as well as anything else. Uh, it's, but God meets all of His people's needs. If I could say, sum up this whole chapter and say anything about what is going on with, uh, with the Holy Spirit's dialogue here through Paul uh, to the Corinthians, you know, if there was some sort of a short summary uh, to it all, I would have to say that what it's really telling me, at least this is in my opinion, is that God meets all of His people's needs. It is God who does it, okay? He uses people to do that. But it is, the glory goes back to God. The work is God's. Though it was God's will that, that is, really is the foundation for it all. Moreover, brethren, verse 1, we do, we do uh, you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Folks, only grace can do that. Law certainly won't. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, only grace can do that. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the grace. I know your authorized version says gift. It's the word is charis, it's grace. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. If you are supporting any ministry, you're only doing it because it, by the will of God. 
insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Dearly beloved, we are not under law, we're under grace. Grace governs our lives from beginning to end, from A to Z and everything in between. Why would giving be any different? Why is it that when it comes to giving and offerings and tithings, all of a sudden mainstream Christianity uh, tends to just revert back to the old covenant, the old, uh, you know, Old Covenant, law, tithing. You know, you really, you know, you just, it's, it's presented to you in such a way as to almost make you feel guilty if you don't participate in, in this giving. And it, and it says, the text clearly says it's not by commandment. Not by commandment. We abound in everything, in faith. In, in utterance and, and that's that's the that's speech logos is the word and knowledge I believe that's the word of God and and it produces diligence love is inseparable you see that in the text love is inseparable from all of this uh, don't give to this ministry because well, because, you know, you think that God is going to somehow bless you, you know, because you do. He's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Give to this ministry, help support this ministry, if that's what you want to do, if that's what God has led you to do, if that's what He's put a willing mind, a willing heart, given you a willing heart to do. But don't do it out of obligation. Don't, do not do that. I say this for your sakes, for, for your sake, y'all's sake, okay? Uh, you could send me, I don't know, you could send me, you could send me tens of thousands of dollars and uh, out of a sense of obligation and uh, that's not, that's not the kind of support that we want to see. You know, there's all kinds of ways to make money. I can, I don't need to do this. I mean, I can, you know, saw an ad in a horse magazine once about a, the guy ran an ad and for $1, if I sent him a dollar, you know, he was going to tell me that the way to, to get rid of horse flies, this, fantastic way that you could just get rid of horse horse fly easily get rid of horse flies uh, he, he found the secret just send him a dollar and he'd tell you how so I sent him a dollar and he he sends two little blocks of wood back little tiny little blocks of wood and with the following instructions uh, place horse fly on block a and hit block a uh, sharply with block B. You can make money. You can make all, you can make money any, any number of ways. Uh, it's, uh, when we're talking about Christian ministry and giving to one another, you know, we've, uh, Many of you probably don't realize that, that oftentimes the offerings that we receive get passed on to someone else in need. Uh, it's not that, uh, you know, I, I mean, I am not a rich guy. You know, uh, we kind of struggle to get along like everybody else, most, most other people, you know. Uh, I preach the Word because I love God, I love the Word, I love His Word, I really love His Word, and I really love His people. And it is extremely important to me that you understand that this whole worldly concept of Christian giving this, that, you, that we see in this system that is, that is highly legalistic, it's based on human merit, is not 
in any way reflective of chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. It's, it's almost like you're reading, I mean, it's, you're, it's, it's, it is so foreign. I mean, our text here in chapter 8 is so foreign to, to ministry today in the main, you know, when it comes to offerings and tithings and, and, and support, you know, stuff like that. It's, and Christians, I think oftentimes they realize they don't have anything to offer. You know, well, I just, I don't have much money. I can't send you any money. I, uh, God is not concerned. The text here it clearly says, folks, that it is accepted. It's first a willing mind. It is accepted according to that that a man hath and not according to that which he hath not. That's what it says. Why in the world would any one of you feel guilty because you couldn't support your ministry, a ministry, this ministry, any other ministry, any other organization, or help another brother in need? It is all by grace. You know, if I just had a flat tire and I was broke down on the highway and you stopped and you said, hey, you need some help, Steve? Uh, you know, because, you know, uh, I'm obligated to help you. I, you know, I really, you know, I don't really want to get out in the hot sun and help you change your flat tire. But I know that if I do, that God is going to be a lot more pleased with me. Just keep driving. All right, I'll somehow I'm going to get that tire changed. I don't want your help. I'm sorry. I just don't. I do not want anyone living under law for me. For my sake. I think our spiritual needs far, God considers our spiritual needs far, far more important than our physical needs. But the fact of the matter is, is that God meets all our needs, all of them, all of them. He hasn't left one stone unturned. There is nothing in your life that God has left you in without, without, I mean, in need of. It may appear that way. I'll admit, and it often does. It often appears as if sometimes God is distant. That he's not near us. He's, he's far off in some far off corner of the galaxy. And he's not really concerned about our lives. And Folks, that is just not true. The God that I know loves us with an undying love. He says that when he's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. He, he's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Join us. Please join us on Wednesdays uh, where we're looking at our, our, our eternal home. It'll be part three. Uh, until next time, you're in our prayers constantly, all of you. You're constantly in my prayers. I pray for you all without ceasing. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.